I'm glad to come again to Wheeler Grove Baptist Church uh, to share in this Good Friday event. Turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 12, and verse 32. The Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse number 32. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Thank you. You may be seated. The grass withers and the flower thereof fadeth away, but the word of our God shall stand forever. I want to talk today about the great attraction. The great attraction. Many of us were riveted to our television screens this week as we watched the awful fire that burned at the Cathedral of Notre Dame over in Paris, France. This 850-year-old cathedral, its spire reaching up to heaven, 750 tons, 1.5 million pounds of spire reaching up to the heavens, this, this marvel of French Gothic architecture, which was not only a working cathedral in France, but a world treasure. People from around the world went to France, not just to visit the Eiffel Tower, not just to walk on the Champs-Élysées, not, not, not just to sail down the River Seine, but to see and be seen at the Cathedral of Notre Dame, made famous by Victor Hugo in his writings of the Hunchback of Notre Dame. St. Thomas Aquinas preached at Notre Dame. This, this beautiful display of French Gothic architecture that has stood for eight centuries in one hour went up in smoke. That 750 ton spire crashed through the ceiling of that magnificent cathedral. And for a moment, the entire world, it seems, stopped to watch Notre Dame burn. 70% of the population of France is Catholic and only 10% go to Mass on Sunday. But the entire city of France, the bit of Paris, the busiest city in the world, stopped to notice the church was on fire. Paris, France the busiest city in the world, stood still to watch Notre Dame on fire. Just suppose, just suppose believers here in Houston would catch fire. Just suppose the Holy Spirit would set our hearts on fire. The city of Houston would stop to watch us burn. Brothers and sisters, if we would ever get in our minds that Jesus Christ 
is the savior of this world. If we could ever shout over the fact that one Friday he died to save us, one Sunday he got up from the grave, and one day he's coming back again, if we ever caught fire, the church would stop, the world would stop to watch the church on fire. When was the last time you caught fire about your faith? When was the last time you burned with enthusiasm on Sunday morning? When, when was the last time you got so excited that you couldn't wait to get to church on Sunday morning? I call Pastor West and Pastor Cosby sometimes on Sunday morning when it rains because Sunday is the only day of the week that the weatherman never has to say, turn around, don't drown. <laughs> you are not going to drown on Sunday morning. Now, you'll drown on Monday morning, but you will not drown trying to make your way to church on Sunday morning. But just suppose we caught fire here on the campus of Texas Southern. Just suppose we shouted until somebody heard the news that Jesus Christ is still mighty to save. Just suppose you in your row would just catch fire right now, excited about what God has already done for you. Uh, I, I mentioned, I mentioned a lily grove. I'm going to move on with this little sermon. I mentioned a lily grove from time to time that you ought to, you ought to bring with you a three by five index card or, or get you an eight by 11 if they have a hard time reading. Uh, but get you a three by five index card and put it on your pew or put it on your, put it on your row, put it next to your purse, put it somewhere where it's conspicuous, where they can see it. And right on there, this is a disclaimer. If you're gonna sit on this row, it's gonna be noisy. If you're going to sit next to me, it's going to be a lot of racket. If you're, going, if you're going to get in this section, it's going to get loud in just a minute because sooner or later, he's going to mention the name Jesus and I'm going to get excited. I don't want to knock your hat off. Uh, I, I don't want to mess up your little purse and all that. So maybe you might want to go sit somewhere else. So you ought to tell the person sitting next to you right now, this is a disclaimer. God's been good to me. And I'm not going to wait till Easter Sunday morning because I might not live that long. I'm about to shout right now. I'm about to tell God thank you right now for the doors you've opened, for the prayers you've answered, for the tears you've dried, for the ways you've made. I'm about to get loud. I'm about to get noisy right now. Let the redeemed of the Lord, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. There's nothing else, there's nothing else that draws men and women, boys and girls, like the uplifted Christ. 20 centuries of Christian history proved the drawing power of Jesus when he is properly lifted up. It is Christ crucified who draws. It is Christ crucified who meets the deepest needs of the hearts of all mankind. It is an atoning savior whose death for the sins of man saves from the holy wrath of an infinitely holy God. Preach any Christ but a crucified Christ and you will not draw men for long. Preach any gospel but a gospel of atonement, and it will not draw men for long. Hear me, brothers and sisters. Unitarianism 
does not draw men because it presents a gospel without atoning blood. Christian science draws crowds like Tom Cruise, Ellen DeGeneres, Robin Williams, and John Travolta who wish to fancy that they have some religion without paying the price. Uh, they have some semblance of God, but there's no sacrifice. There is no costly sympathy. It is a bloodless gospel so that it does not draw men to Christ. Congregationalism has a theology without a crucified Savior, without the atoning blood, and thus one of its famed seminaries, Andover Newton, is now merging with Yale Divinity School because the other year Andover Newton graduated only three students because they have a theology with no blood in it. They have a preaching with no crucified Christ. But why does Christ lifted up on the cross still draw men to himself? He says, I, if I be lifted up, not your opinion, not your philosophy, not your theocentric piety, but I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men not to a doctrine, not to a personal kind of deity, not to some church or some creed or some ritual or some tradition, but I will draw all men to myself. And brothers and sisters, you hear me? If you only come to church because of the pastor, you ain't gonna come long. If you only come to church because it's a Baptist church, when life turns on you, you're going to make it to the Muslims or you're going to find yourself in the Catholic church or, or you'll be someplace else. But if you don't come to church for any other reason other than Jesus Christ, you're coming for the wrong reason because we are not here because of Baptist polity. We are here because of the person of Jesus Christ. A crucified Jesus is still making people leave Galveston and Humble. They're still leaving Baytown and Sugar Land. They're still leaving Missouri City and Greatwood. They're still coming from 288 and 59 and 45, making their way to the campus of Texas Southern, bad as this traffic is in Houston, bad as this parking is on this campus. It'll be an hour before you get out of that garage. You mad right now just thinking about, Reverend, hurry up so I can be the first one out of here to get to my car. But you came anyway because of a crucified Jesus. He died. Didn't he die? Have I got a witness here? And the only reason we are here today is because one Friday, they lifted him up. Now, brothers and sisters, hear me. Jesus on a cross is a crucifix. Jesus on a cross is a crucifix. But on a crucifix is a dead Jesus. That's why it's so quiet at the Catholic Church. That's, so, that's why it's so quiet at the Episcopalian Church. Because hanging visibly in their sanctuary is a crucifix. And on that crucifix is a dead Jesus. You can't make no noise on a dead Jesus. 
It makes no sense to shout for a dead Jesus. But I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he's living. Whatever men may say, I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. Somebody ought to help me preach it. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me. He talks with me. You can't shout on no dead Jesus. Because when life gets hard, I need somebody who's alive. When my enemies start lying on me, I need somebody who can come to my rescue. When old age comes and steals my health from me, I need somebody to walk with me and I can't shout over a dead Jesus. Why? Why does Christ lifted up on the cross still make men and women shout? Well, two reasons. Christ crucified meets our greatest need. That's the first reason. What is our greatest need? Our greatest, most fundamental need is a savior. If we had needed money, God would have sent us an economist. If we had needed Wisdom, God would have sent us a philosopher. But since we needed salvation, God sent us a savior. Now, brothers and sisters, all men need an atoning savior who can, by his death, make propitiation for our sins, thus reconciling us to a holy God, delivering us from his awful wrath and bringing us out into the sunlight of his glorious favor. Uh, Christianity is the only religion that offers an atoning savior. Buddha, the founder of Buddhism, offers enlightenment but he doesn't offer salvation. <laughs> Confucianism offers a great teacher, but it doesn't offer an atoning savior. The Muhammad or the, the religion of Muhammadism offers Muhammad and the Muslim faith, but it does not offer salvation. And for that reason, in the language of the late Dr. A. Lewis Patterson, Buddha's bones are somewhere bleaching on a lonely hillside. <laughs> Mohammed's voice is hushed. Confucius' vision is silent. Resting in the couch of nature's night to await the dawn of eternity's ripening. But the grave in Jerusalem is still empty. The cross is still empty. We do not serve a dead Jesus on a crucifix. We serve a risen Savior from an empty tomb. He became sin for us who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus Christ offers himself lifted up on the cross to draw us from the curse of the law, thus becoming a curse for us. For the word says, cursed is he that hangeth on a tree. I need to tell somebody in here this afternoon who think you're pretty good. Uh, and you're just in here because all the rest of us are in here. And, and you don't need all this cross talk and all this Jesus conversation. This, this sounds good, but I just want to see what was happening over at TSU. I don't, I don't really need all of that because I'm a nice person. Uh, I don't steal, I don't drink, 
Uh, I, don't, I haven't stolen anything. I haven't broken in anybody's house. I'm, I'm basically a good person. Let me see if I can help you with that. Uh, the only people in here who is above sin is those of us sitting up here on this platform. And when church is over and we come down there, we will be just as low down as you are. Because Romans 3.23 doesn't say y'all have sinned. All have sinned. I wish I had somebody to help me talk here. We need an atoning Savior. The Bible uses three words to talk about sin. Uh, the first word is trespass. To trespass means to step across the line. Uh, to color outside the line, to go astray. It means to step over the boundary. Everybody in here can testify that we have crossed the line. And you ought to be careful crossing the line because it's a thin line between weakness and wickedness. And so thin is the line that you don't know when you crossed it. So you ought to stay close to the Lord because to trespass means to step over the line. And then the Bible talks about sin. Sin in the Greek is the word harmatia. It means missing the mark. Uh, I aimed at it, but I missed it. I tried my best, but I missed it. Somebody here has had the same experience that I've had but I wake up in the morning and I really intend to have a good spiritual, godly, holy day. And then, and then, and then about 8.15, for some of y'all it's 9 o'clock, for some of you it's 12, for some of you it's 5 in the afternoon. For me it's about around 8.16 or 17 in the morning. All that praying I just got through doing, somebody ought to help me preach here. And then even when I'm praying, stuff comes in my mind that ain't got no business being there. Then I have to say to myself, how did that get in there? Now, I'm not talking to you super saints who see no evil and hear no evil. I'm talking to people just like myself who aim at it, but you miss it often. See how quiet you got right there? Paul said every time. I desire to do good, evil is always present. The good that I would do, I find myself not doing, and the evil that I don't want to do, that's exactly what I do. Oh, wretched man, not that I was, but that I am. And then there's another word that the Bible uses for sin is the word iniquity. That word iniquity means that there's something bent. There's something crooked in every last one of us. I, I need to warn you. I know I told you to put a disclaimer down there and tell them that you, you're going to shout here in a minute, but I need to warn you. You're sitting next to a crook. Watch your pocketbook. Watch your billfold. Make sure you got your cell phone in your hand. I don't care how pretty they look, they're crooks. Come on, talk back to me if you can. I don't care how holy they're acting right now, they got their Mac makeup on and all, they're crooks. I don't care how black that suit is. I don't care nothing about the serving the Lord's Supper. Everybody in here is a crook. Thank God today for grace, for mercy. He looked beyond my faults. I wish I had a witness here. There's some decisions I wish I hadn't made. There's some wrong roads I wish I hadn't traveled. There's some skeletons in my closet that if I opened the door, every last one of them would fall out right now. But thank God for grace. Mercy, 
forgiveness. Thank God I have an atoning Savior. That's why I lifted Jesus. It's still drawing men to come to church because a crucified Savior meets our deepest needs. A crucified Savior meets our greatest, deepest, most fundamental need. Now let me back up here and talk to somebody who has not gone as far as you could go. God forgives the stuff that you haven't done yet. Don't, don't, don't brag on I ain't never been to jail. You ain't been to jail yet. I wish I had one or two more witnesses. Uh, I said it's a Lily Grove, Pastor. And uh, they, they kind of think I'm off sometimes. I, I, I didn't mean that for a joke. No. But um, I've never been drunk. I've never been to a club. Reverend Lawson and I are going to go on for our birthday. Uh, I've never smoked weed. Because I've been in church all my life. I've, I've been, I'm a musician. I've been playing the music. I was an organist for our church, played the piano for the association and the state convention, and I've been going to church all my life. I've been in church ever since I've known myself. Started preaching at 18, started pastoring at 20. I never had a young adult life. Uh, I've been in church all my life, leading the music, leading the worship. I've never done anything young adults do. And so I have some things on my bucket list. Uh, Reverend Lawson and I are going to a club. Uh, I've never been drunk. I'm thinking about it. Uh, I've never been high smoking weed. I, I want to know what that feels like. I've seen them do it. I, I want to try that. God has forgiven the stuff I haven't done yet. Somebody ought to help me preach here. So many of you, like myself, who's been in church all your life, you had to do all your sinning in church. I've sinned since I've been a Christian. I wish I had a witness here. I've disappointed God since I've been a preacher. But thank God for goodness and mercy just keeps on following me all the days of my... I, I need a crook in here this afternoon who know that if it had not been for the Lord who was on your side, you're not in jail, not because you don't deserve to be there, because salvation is not just what God has done for you, it's what God has kept you from. He kept me from danger seen and unseen. A crucified Savior meets my deepest need. But secondly, as I hurry to the close, a crucified Savior reveals the love of God. That's what this service is all about. That's what Good Friday is all about. Uh, you, you've, you've read John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his uniquely born son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's, that's John 3, 16. But you ought to read 1 John 3, 16. 1 John 3, 16 says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 8 says, But God commended his love toward us 
in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, brothers and sisters, if that doesn't move you, that's because you think you're pretty good already. But to those of us who know that we're crooks, we know that we are low down. We know that we ain't even got no business in here today. We know that if the Lord just turned his back, we'd be the biggest fool in the city of Houston. We know that there's no good thing in us. God just chooses to love us. I, I, was, I was in revival this past week in Alexandria, Louisiana. And I don't guess they're going to invite me back anymore, Pastor. Uh, because I, I messed up. Last night they were singing a song. And, and I should have left it alone because it, it wasn't my church. It, it was none of my business. Uh, but but I, couldn't, I, I couldn't leave it alone. Because it fits so well into what I was trying to talk about last night. And, and they, they were singing this song. It's a beautiful song. I've heard it. And, and I've asked them not to sing it at, at Lily Grove. And hopefully you don't sing it at Wheeler. If you do, I'm going to come over here and stop you when I hear it. It's not my church, but I'm going to come over here and, and, and put a stop to it. You hear that? I don't want to hear it. Um, the song was, He Thought I Was Worth Saving. Uh, beautiful song. Sounds real good. But, but theologically, it's wrong. Because God did not save us because he thought we were worth saving. Because there's nothing in me worth saving. I wish I had somebody to help me. There's nothing about me that's worth, I'm talking about me, I'm not talking about you. There's nothing about me as, as a matter of fact, the Bible says there is none that doeth good. There's none righteous. No, not one. So God did not save me because he thought I was worth saving. God just commended his love to me. God just, just sent his love toward me. Why? I was yet in my sins, Christ died for me. I'm, I'm trying to get you excited about that because all the other so-called religions of the world say for you to come get yourself together first, then come over here and meet us. That's what the Muslims tell us. That's what the Christian scientists tell us. That's, that's what the Congregational and the Unitarian Church says. Come over, just get yourself together and after you get on your feet, come over here and meet us. But I'm glad Jesus didn't wait for me to get on my feet because the church is not for people who are on their feet. The church is not for people who got it all together. The church is not for people who are perfect and not making any mistakes. The church is for people who got some scars on their backs. The church is for people who've messed up big time. The church is for people who know that if the Lord had not saved you because he just loves you, you would be in hell right now. God saved me. Not because he thought I was worth saving. He saved me just because he loves me. I'm through now. But I don't know why Jesus loves me. I don't know why he cares. I don't know why he sacrificed his life. Oh, but I'm glad. I'm glad he did. I said, I'm glad. I'm glad not just on Friday, but I'm glad on Wednesday. I'm glad on a Tuesday morning. Every time I wake up and think about where I could have been, what God could have let happen to me, but God kept me in my right mind. God put a hedge around me so that when my enemies tried to get to me, God blocked them and, and no weapon formed against me was able to prosper. 
I wish I had somebody to help me preach here. You're here today not because you have a degree from college, because there are some people with a college degree who slept under a bridge last night. You're not here because you've been being careful and going to the doctor keeping your appointments, because some people who kept their appointments died this morning. You're not here because you wear a big cross around your neck, because wearing a cross is not the same as bearing a cross. I wish I had one or two more witnesses here. Brothers and sisters, the attraction that drew all of us here to Texas Southern's campus is a crucified Jesus. The reason all of us got dressed to get over here this afternoon is because one Friday on a hill called Calvary, Jesus died for us. He didn't die for any good people. He died for sinners like you and me. I wish I had one or two more witnesses here. Who knows that the attraction today is not this auditorium where we are seated, not this choir in the choir loft, and not even because Reverend Anderson is doing the preaching. Because the biggest crook in here is preaching to you right now. But I have this treasure in an earthen vessel that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. I need one or two more sinners in here this afternoon. Who knows that if the Lord had not saved you, you would be lost and in hell. You are attracted to this Jesus because he was born in Bethlehem, reared in Nazareth, baptized in the Jordan, Perform miracles in a desert place, wept over Jerusalem, prayed in Gethsemane. You are here this afternoon because he's Adam's redeemer. He's Abel's vindicator. He's Abraham's sacrifice. He's Noah's ark. You're going to help me call him, won't you? You are here this afternoon because he's Ezekiel's wheel in the middle of a wheel. He's Job's horse pawing in the valley. He's God's only son. He's Mary's baby boy. He's James and Jude's older brother. He's Matthew's king. He's Mark's suffering servant. He's Luke's great physician. He's John's word made flesh. He's Acts coming of the Holy Ghost. He's the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He's the blessed and the only potentate. He's the faithful and the true witness. He's Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. He's the lily of the valley. He's the bright and the morning star. He's the rose of Sharon. He's the day spring of Israel. He's the stem of Jesse. He's the root of David distinctive in supernatural capacity, superlative in sovereign majesty, exclusive in spiritual beauty, radiant in eternal splendor, matchless in supernal deity. He's the God of gods. He's the prince of princes. He's the Pharisee of 10,000. He's the bright and the morning star. He's the lily of the valley. Y'all know him, don't you? One Friday on a hill called Calvary, he died. Didn't he die? What a wonderful attraction. But bright early Sunday morning, he arose. Didn't he rise? But as wonderful as that attraction is, that's not the greatest attraction. As beautiful as that attraction is, that's not the most wonderful attraction. One of these days, the skies will break wide open and the warrior King Christ will leave his seat at the right hand of power, wave his hand and swear the time that has been shall be no more. That will be a wonderful attraction. By and by, when the morning comes, when all 
the saints of God are gathering home, we will tell the story of how we've overcome. We'll understand it better by and by. If you want to shout there, you might want to practice right now. If you're going to give God glory in heaven, you might want to get in practice right now. If you're going to shout when it's over, you might want to start shouting right now. If he doesn't do anything else, I wish I had a witness. If he doesn't answer another prayer, if he doesn't pay another bill, if he doesn't open another door, he's already, already, already done more than enough. Is there anybody here not going to wait till the battle is over? You're not going to wait till your prayer is answered. You're not going to wait till your victory comes. You're going to go ahead and shout right now. Go ahead, shout right now. Tell him thank you, thank you, thank you for all you've done for me. Thank you. You've been a mother for me. Thank you. You've been a father for me. Thank you. You've been a company keeper. Thank you. You brought me. Ah, you brought me. You can't. 